Uh, and welcome to another episode of The Many Hats of Coco. I'm the host, Theo Shuk, and today we're at the Tronson Art Gallery in Springfield, Oregon. Uh, today we have a special guest with us today, uh, artist Jerry Ross, who has a show coming up in this very gallery that will be showing through the end of November of this year, 2017. And Jerry, care to come up and join me? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I uh, have a lot to go over. Um, this is some of your artwork, uh, and uh, I was really fascinated. I went to your website, and a lot of great information, mm -hmm. and we're going to uh, be sure to mention that website uh, before we... So, Theo, is that a Dutch name? Are you of Dutch extraction? Uh, Theodore? No. Theodore. No. Uh, that's a great uh, Dutch uh, name in Holland. Uh, yeah, actually, I believe uh, Van Gogh's brother was yes, a Theodore, uh, absolutely. if I'm not mistaken. And absolutely. I believe he was, uh, they called him Theo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What I wanted to get to was uh, the Holland book uh, online. Uh, oh, this that, one that here. You're, Exhibiting, yeah. My wife put this together. My wife, Angela, put this together for me. That's great. And is that on your website? This is on the website, yes. Oh. If you go to books, mm -hmm. uh, there's a tab that'll take you to this. What's and, the whole website? Uh, yeah. It's uh, jerryrosspitore.com. Or, uh, dot com. Mm. Jerry Ross Pitore, P I T T O R E, dot com. Thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Holland collection yeah. that you just... Well, I had a great opportunity to have a one-month painting residency in Holland, which uh, started out, I was trying to get a res residency in Portugal. The group is called Obras, which in Portugal means work in progress. They were filled up in Portugal, but they had an opening in Rencom, Holland. So, you know, out of the blue, I didn't know anything about this location, but I decided, yes, I want to do it because it's a great opportunity. You get one month, 30 days, in a house with a studio, and you have complete uh, run of the house. It's just you alone. And it's an opportunity for undistracted work, so you can really get a body of work put together in 30 days. Mm -hmm. So is it set up like a studio? Do, do you have to bring your own um, uh, paints and do they have easels for you to go? And they had easels. They had two, maybe three easels, but um, I did a lot of plain air work, so I had to bring my own plain air portable easel that collapses. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, in the book, uh, there's a page in here showing the, uh, this is the easel that um, is provided. Okay. But on the next page, you'll probably see uh, the easel that I had, which is right here um, somewhere. Yeah, right here. See the portable easel, and it has the painting on the, on the easels. So my oh, routine, okay. my routine. I don't know if you know this, but Holland is, is a uh, country that really believes in the bicycle. Mm. What astounded me is they have intercity bike paths, not just within the city, but intercity. Mm -hmm. So it's very typical when you talk to your Dutch friends that they take a bicycle to Italy or they take a bicycle to Spain. It's not a, not a big problem. Within Holland, they can take a bike to any Dutch city. And what amazes me is it's not just the, they have a main bike path that's pretty wide painted red. Uh -huh. But they have all these alternate bike paths, maybe five or six alternate pa pa uh, bike paths through the forest and through uh, farmlands. And they publish maps for all the people who want to take the bike 
route, you know, this particular bike route and then change to another route. And at, along the way, they have places where you come and go to uh, published sites, interesting things mm -hmm. to see and do, mm -hmm. rest areas, unbelievable for bicycles. Hmm. So do they have like a tour guide book for that? Uh, they do all, all this stuff is online for the Dutch. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. apps, so you download an app, you get on your bike, and you can tell when you get to a certain location by reading the sign and consulting your app mm -hmm. exactly where you are and where you want to go next. Hmm. That's all well and good. I want to get to your art. Okay. Uh, you actually uh, told me a couple of things about some pieces. These are your pieces behind. Yeah. And maybe you could just, uh, to, to get an idea of your art. So you did 30 paintings in 30 days. One a day, yeah, pretty much. Uh, That's pretty intense. Let me start with this one because uh, in the seventh, 17th century in Holland, was called the golden age of Dutch painting. So mm -hmm. you had Rembrandt, Franz Hals, Vermeer. So this is my copy of uh, Vincent uh, van uh, Lawrence, who was a noble and was painted by Franz Hals. I didn't know this because I just did this from a, a photograph or an image I found on the internet, but in reality, a lot of these are real small paintings. I, it kind of blew my mind when I went to museums and mm. saw the Franz Halls. A lot of them are very small. But this is how I interpreted it. And uh, what I like about Franz Halls is he, uh, he believed he was a painter of realism, but with a loose brush. So he, this is the 17th century. And the Dutch had this way, both, you can see it also in Vermeer. They anticipate modern art by emphasizing structure and loose brushwork, which was in the golden age of, uh, especially Rembrandt. Rembrandt had a 20-foot long brush. A lot, of, right? a lot yeah. of people didn't know that, but he would get way back from the painting and paint with this thing that seemed like impossible to handle. <laughs> and when you step back, when you get close to a Rembrandt, it kind of breaks up, but when you step back from a Rembrandt, it all comes together. That's fascinating. I would have, uh, I would have imagined the loose brush more an impressionistic, just because it seems like you would lose some control. Absolutely, but uh, the beginnings of, let's say, uh, impressionism really is in the golden era of Dutch painting, uh, Rembrandt mm. and mm. Vermeer uh, and Franz Hals. Franz Hals painted often inebri inebriated, mm -hmm. so I'm glad we're drinking some wine here to... In the so, so, we, so we can relate? <laughs> we can relate to Franz Hals. Here's to that. But his style was revolutionary because it was very loose. And the <clears throat> Dutch really appreciated this kind of loose approach. So uh, what happened was I was in Renkum, which is known as an artist's village for a very important reason. Uh, in the 19th century, especially the late 19th century, there was a, a movement in France called the Barbizon School. So you had Millet, you had Corot, uh, Dubigny would uh, arrive in, in a province of France known as uh, the Barbizon, and they would uh, paint outdoors in the plain air. That was the beginning of plain air painting. Their style was still very realistic, very tight, wasn't loose like Impressionism. But later on, the Dutch imitated the Barbizon school in Rencom. And uh, the painters of the, it's called the Dutch Barbizon, were in the area where I was having my residency. Historically, mm -hmm. the school of Osterbeck is, uh, is the Dutch Barbizon school. Mm -hmm. And they painted impressionistically. And what was nice, uh, I was kind of impressed of, about the town, because when you, the town is about the size of Junction City, um, maybe a little smaller. But when you walk through the downtown of Rencombe, by the way, Rencombe is on the east part of uh, the ne Netherlands, closer to the German border. It's okay. not where Amsterdam is, which is on the west. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, when you walk through Rencombe, they have these large reproductions of all the, the paintings from the school of Osterbeck uh, on every block and in stores. So you would go into a store and they would have one hanging from the ceiling, you know. So it was a way to really appreciate and honor their, their uh, they call them the old masters of uh, Rencombe. In actuality, they were more modern. Hmm, hmm. 
you also told me about this young lady who was uh, one of your subjects. How did this come about? Well, one of the real kicks I had was meeting the people right around the house. So when I first got there, I started painting the backyard. This is actually my backyard, and I, I, it's a good example of my work because it's got a very loose, impressionistic mm -hmm. style of the garden. So I started painting the backyard of the house where I was staying in Rencombe, and this little girl uh, appeared over the wall mm -hmm. with about six or seven friends and started try talking to me in Dutch. And uh, <laughs> what they wanted was if I could return the soccer ball they had kicked over the wall. You know? and, uh, they were using that as an excuse to find out who I was, and they came in. It was very interesting how I interacted with the kids, very first thing. Uh, so I took a snap of her because I thought her face looked so radiant, and then I painted from this uh, snapshot I made of her. I ended up giving that to her mother, and uh, I also did, a, in the book you'll see, there's a, a painting of a Dutch boy with ball holding the actual soccer ball. Mm -hmm and gave it to, to his parents. But the next door neighbor was Simon uh, Fuchs. Simon Fuchs is a bookbinder. He uh, was enamored with Toulouse-Lautrec. And he had all these books about Toulouse-Lautrec and Toulouse-Lautrec's teacher. And anyway, I could go on and on about Simon. He invited me over for dinner. A real Dutchman, a real character. Uh, the Dutch all have some kind of uh, manual trade that they do or some talent, and his is bookbinding. And then the other portrait over there is Gerhard, Gerard, Gerard, G E R A R D. Uh, he owned a, an Airbnb in, uh, in Rencombe, and he and I became good friends. We went biking, bicycling together, had a lot in common. And I ended up doing his portrait, which he purchased. So what you're seeing there, in fact, Simon purchased his portrait. I ended up doing portraits mm. of each of those guys and got real close to them as a result. They liked that. They bought the paintings. So th these are actually digital print to canvas. And they look like they might be the real, the real deal, but yeah. they're, not, they're not original. Oh, wow. Hmm. Which brings me to another subject. One thing I discovered upon returning from Holland is kind of a new uh, approach to painting, which is to take the digital print to canvas and then to keep painting on it. Because often, people don't know this, but oil painters often uh, get to a stage in painting that they really like, but they go a little too far and it turns into something else. And you say to yourself, gee, I would like to go back to that spot where I ruined it, you know, or where I took it too far. Well, if you take a picture of each stage along the way of your painting, I discovered you can do a digital print to canvas. And then, it's interesting, if you go with oil paint on top of that, uh, for a while, it, no matter what you do, it still looks like a print. But it reaches a stage of saturation where the oil paint begins to stay on the surface. And at that point, you actually have a new original work of art. So you don't necessarily lose the original. You put enough paint on it, and it can be sold as an authentic original, even though underneath it is some kind of print material. So you keep saying oil. Is it acrylic, or are you actually working with oils? An oil paint. Wow. People don't do that much. It takes forever to dry. Well, here's the deal. This one on the corner mm -hmm. is one of those digital prints that I painted on with oil paint. Mm -hmm. And I changed it quite a bit. Uh, but right now, uh, what I found out is something about the type of canvas they use when they print, do a digital print to canvas absorbs mm -hmm. the oil quite quickly. This means the drying time is almost like acrylics. Is that right? So you can paint on that with oils. The only thing I did discover, and a lot of this is experimental at this stage, but I did discover that if you take a rag and you rub it down, a real oil painting, if you rub it, let's say what had dried earlier will still be there, but not in this case. If you rub it with a rag, everything goes, because there's some kind of substrate from the ink mm. from the printer mm -hmm. that wipes mm -hmm. everything away. So if you're careful, however, 
Mm. Make small changes at, uh, uh, incrementally. You can rescue your, your paintings that you thought were lost forever. So it's kind of a discovery. Yeah, kind of fun. Yeah. Well, we have time. Let's talk a little about, bit about you. Okay. Uh, did you always know you were a painter? Have you been painting since you were a child? When, when did this passion grab you? Uh, I paint, I'm a childhood painter. I was kind of painting at the age of six or seven, and I don't know why. I was asking my father for an old oil painting set. I don't have any idea why I was doing that. Um, my father finally relented and gave me a professional oil painting set. I was about eight, eight years old when I finally got a hold of that. And then in, L, L, in grade school, uh, a teacher had uh, kind of singled me out as being very talented. And she, uh, she asked my mother if I could go with her on Saturdays to a grown-up art school on the weekends, on, just on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I, my mother agreed that I could do that. And it was like for $1. And uh, so I did that for several years, maybe three years. Mm -hmm. And I was out painting with teenagers. The other students were teenagers. Mm -hmm. I was like eight or nine years old. So that really, you know, when you are that young and you're hanging out with teenagers who are painting, you know, you feel so, eh, you know, I'm special. I, I can do this forever. <laughs> so I kind of did that. Uh, so you're from, I, I read your autobiography, uh, you're from the Buffalo, New York area. Yeah. Did that color your perspective at all, do you feel, uh, coming from a cold blue collar environment? Absolutely. Uh, they call it, Buffalo's called the city of no illusions uh, for many reasons. It's an industrial working class uh, Bethlehem steel based uh, economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now Bethlehem's gone, but uh, at, at the time I was growing up, it was blue collar industrial working class, very kind of drab town, mm -hmm. mafia infested. Uh, and then eventually I got into radical politics when I was at the university, uh, anti war. Mm -hmm. Just watching the Ken Burns uh, Vietnam series, oh, yeah, yeah. Saw, my, saw our banner, the Buffalo Nine, because I was in a federal trial, two federal trials, uh, as a result of a, 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 a draft card burning uh, situation sanctuary in a Unitarian church, and we, we were attacked by FBI agents and federal marshals. Mm -hmm. And I ended up uh, two federal trials. Fortunately, I had a hung jury in both. Mm -hmm. But some of the guys went to prison for six years in federal penitentiary. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that begs the question, did, did uh, politics color your art at any point here? Absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. In fact, I've been involved in local arts politics here in Eugene for quite a while. Uh, I have. I just want to show. Uh, uh, we, I used to get a lot of good press from the Register Guard. Uh, as an example, uh, Bob Kiefer, who was fired from the Register Guard, who was our art editor, mm -hmm. uh, here is Painter of the People, Jerry Ross Tackles Whole Crowds in a New Series of Pictures, picture of me in my studio. And we used to have in this town, uh, we used to have a lot of things for the visual arts. We had Bob Kiefer, who was an art critic. Mm -hmm. You don't see articles like this anymore in the Guard. Bob was fired because he stood up for a fellow reporter who was uh, in a labor dispute with the Guard, and they ended up firing her and Bob for supporting her, mm -hmm. and that was the end of that. So uh, anyway, you can see what Bob did here, painter of the people. He, under he spent time with the painter, understood what they were trying to do, their politics or whatever, and, and did justice to it. But we've also lost the Eugene Celebration, the Mayor's Art Show, the Jacobs Gallery, the Diva Downtown Initiative for the Visual Arts. We've lost everything in this town related to the visual arts. So that kind of politics I've been involved in quite mm -hmm. a, for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But I've also been involved in the more uh, heavy-duty stuff uh, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in the Eugene area? About 40-some 40, 40 years, yeah. And then this is certainly home. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's always good to get back to Eugene. Yeah. <laughs> is there an, an artist in particular that uh, inspires you or that... Uh, well, as you can see from my inspiration from the Dutch, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I have many uh, inspirations, but uh, the group of artists from Tuskegee known as the E. Macchiaioli. I do not know them. Okay, they, uh, there's a, the key words, the root word of E. Macchiaioli is macchia. So this is a group of painters in Tuscany uh, in the Ottocento, which is the 1800s, mm -hmm. around 1850. They started painting in an impressionistic style 10 years before the French in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they were followers of Garibaldi. The, uh, they were soldiers. This is one of the unique situations where a group of artists, of painters, joined a revolutionary army as the core fighters of that army, mm. coming out of a, an art movement. And uh, the idea was to unify Italy, to establish a, a, the republic over a monarchy, mm -hmm. uh, to redistrib redistribute the land, uh, establish social justice for various groups, uh, emancipation of women, women's rights, women right to vote, uh, breaking down the doors of the Jewish ghetto and letting Jews assimilate into society. All those things were goals of the Risorgimento. And these painters got behind that. Those crazy artists. <laughs> always, <laughs> always. <laughs> Theo, I think Coco has a question. Ah, Coco has some questions. Well, Coco, I'm glad you can make it. Uh, Hello, well, Jerry. Hi, Angela. How would you Coco. describe your style? Coco. I'm sorry, Coco. How would you describe your style? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So my style uh, would be described as, well, impressionistic or expressionistic. It's a little confusing there. Uh, impressionism uh, was characterized by putting many people in the painting who were, I would call, bourgeois people on vacation. You know, picnic, mm -hmm. picnic mm -hmm. on the, mm -hmm. in the grass mm -hmm. or... Uh, um, people lounging about with umbrellas and boats and this kind of thing. Right. That, that was the French Impressionists. The Expressionists, or even the Post-Impressionists like Van Gogh, uh, they had more angst. They had more. Uh, they were bleeding more. They were more involved in the uh, the people and various socialist causes, mm -hmm. and their, therefore their work is a little more serious. Mm -hmm. In some cases, less colorful but always more uh, dal vero, after truth, after life, verita. They put the people in the fields. Absolutely. Yeah. Wor uh, the, wor the work of the e Machiaioli depicted people doing work, useful work, especially women. Wh they depicted the lives of women that had been ignored completely by artists, going about their daily chores and doing daily work in the fields or in the home. That kind of thing, they painted the Jewish ghetto in uh, Florence, Italy, mm -hmm. in Rome, and they depicted truth, mm -hmm. which had been uh, taboo prior to that time. So mm -hmm. my style is based on that. So, for example, when I went there, um, went to Holland this time, I uh, painted uh, the backyard as I saw it. I painted the canals by getting on the bike and going there, uh, the wild horses along the Rhine, and the ferry boat along the Rhine. Mm -hmm. Basically, everyday life as I encountered it and saw it. And mm -hmm. It's both impressionistic and expressionistic at the same time. Hmm. Thank you. Great question, Coco. Do we have some more? Yes. Uh, Jerry, I would like to ask you regarding your trip to the Netherlands. Did you plan ahead for all 30 paintings, or was it a day-to-day -day decision? And a second part of that question is, where are those paintings now? Um, pretty much there was no planning involved. I didn't even know what to expect. I arrived there. I knew I was going to do some painting, but I had no idea what it was going to be. So I started on the backyard. Then I started in on the neighbors. And then I finally had courage to get on the bike. They had three bicycles there. I finally had the courage to get on the bicycles with my art equipment. Went down to the ferry boat, and the guy in the ferry boat says, would you do a painting of the ferry boat? So I did a painting of the ferry boat and gave it to the ferry boat guys. Then I realized, well, I need a copy of that, so I made a, another copy for myself of the ferry boat painting. And uh, anyway, I ended up with 30 paintings at the end, 
which are now sitting in our basement to be transported over to the Jim Tronson Gallery for the opening of the show on Friday the 13th, such a lucky day. Uh, uh, I know this is going to air after our reception, but uh, we're going for two months, October and November, you'll be able to see all 30 mm -hmm. paintings mm -hmm. that I did during the residency. Yeah. I would like to uh, uh, make sure that we uh, direct people to your website. Okay. So if you can spell it out. Yeah. And we'll also show it under the screen, too. So. Okay, great. It's Jerry with a J. All, it's all one word. Jerry Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. The last part is a little difficult. It means painter in Italian. It's pittore. P-I-T-T-O-R-E dot com. Great, and great. you got it. <laughs> great. Well, that's it for us today. Jerry, it's been such hey. a pleasure having you, and uh, enjoy the show at Tronson. Great gallery. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you.